Okay. Hello and welcome everybody to my talk called uh, Simple Modern Java Microservices in the Cloud. If somebody's reaction to this title is bingo, or can I put more buzzwords, your reaction is correct. Uh, and now to be completely honest, if you're hoping to see how to build a lot of microservices quickly with which framework and which library, this is not this kind of talk. This talk is about what happens if you have a lot of microservices and what are the consequences and what are some of the unwanted cons consequences so that you can live happily while having some microservices and not going crazy. And of course, uh, well, today is uh, the 957th day of the pandemic and also, very sadly and tragically, the 243rd day of Russian invasion in Ukraine in which everybody knows, I think, what's happening. So if you want to do some good, donating to that cause is probably a worthy idea. Now, TLDR, I know, it's after lunch. You might be sleepy. If you fall asleep, this talk was about how to deal with complexity uh, to do with a lot of microservices. There are book recommendations at the end. Uh, if you want the slides, tweet me or email me and I will share them with you and we can pretend nothing happened. Uh, if you'd like to uh, know who I am, I'm Andrzej Grzesik. I have a Twitter, I have an email. I also have a blog, but it's kind of dead because I cannot finish any of the posts that I start writing, so I don't publish it anymore. I'm also very proud to be a Java champion and have been a Java 1 rockstar when Java 1 was still a thing, and now it's back, supposedly. I haven't been to this one, so uh, we can only hope for the best. I also am one of the organizers of this conference, so if you're happy, tell me. If you're unhappy, tell me as well, but I hope there is not a lot of that. Uh, of course, I represent no companies in this talk, so all of my opinions are my own. All of my uh, mistakes are my own, and they are not intended, but I'm only a human, which means they might happen. If you have any questions, if I manage to see you uh, raising your hands or screaming the questions, I'll try to answer them. If not, uh, there is this awesome thing called Slido, which I told you about at the, at the opening, so you know about it, uh, use it, and uh, the magic people in this room will help those questions get to me. If you feel shy or uh, very well fed after the lunch, uh, I have some questions baked into the conference so we can, again, pretend nothing happened. Also, I like dry jokes because they remind me I need to drink. So, with that, let's begin and let's examine this subject one word by word. What makes Java microservices in the cloud modern. What's, what, where does the modern factor come in? When can you say modern? What, where can you not say modern? What's, what's the, the breaking point? Is it the language? I don't know, we'll look at it. Is it technology? We'll have a thought about that as well. Is it being in the cloud? Well, if it's microservices in the cloud, you have to be in the cloud, but then which cloud are you on and will that make you modern? We'll, we'll talk about it as well. Is it the framework? Is it the architecture? Well, maybe. But apart from that, there is this very nice thought or idea. Uh, maybe you've had it working in your projects, or maybe you wish you could do it working in your projects. How would it be to write software without having to deal with all the bloat that there is? So imagine writing software in the most productive environment you want it to be. Whatever process, whatever tools, everything works just best. So is that a single way of uh, approaching that? Maybe, yes. And if we try to go through each and every one of you idea about what that situation would look like, we will probably get quite a number of different answers, but there will be some patterns. And there will be some patterns and we'll try to explore that. So let's start with this awesome movie. So what is bloat? Where does bloat come from? I said we'll start with the language, so let's ask the question. Which language should we use? Which language should we use to write our microservices? As in, if we ask uh, Jaroslav right now uh, in another room, he probably will say Java 19 and not Kotlin. Some people in here might say Scala. Some people might say Groovy. Somebody might say something else, something else, something else. And you can be successful or be unsuccessful in any of those languages. I would even say that it's more of a factor about how you use the language. And I also like to call it the 2 a.m. check. 2 a.m. check works like this. You were, for example, at a conference and ended up somewhere in the city. And fun was being had, the way you like to have fun. Let's not get into that. You'll explore it on your own. And then 
the strange things hap happens. The scary thing happens. The support phone. Your help is required. You need to open your corporate company laptop and fi help fix something. Is the language helping you? Is it getting in the way? Is it squiggly lines kind of uh, software or is it actually very explicit? Maybe a bit on the verbose side, but at least you can reason about it when you're tired. I like things that are explicit because they help me. I don't like surprises. I don't like having to solve... Uh, difficult brain puzzles just to figure out what those few lines of code are doing because, uh, as I said, I'm only a human being and I make mistakes. Sometimes I make a lot of them very quickly, but I want things to be explicit because then I can reason about it. And that, to me, converts just to my personal preferences for things go doing, doing things in Java. Sometimes in Skylife I need the power of the type system. But I like both. They are both statically typed and compiled and they work very well. Some organizations might, for example, default to Java. Right now with the rapid releases, I, I would say that this is a very good choice. Uh, some organizations might say you should use Kotlin. I don't have an opinion. Yaroslav has an opinion. I'll talk to him, he's, he's definitely an expert. Uh, the, uh, there is one thing that I have discovered that doesn't work in a uh, situation in which you have a lot of microservices and you have a lot of tests. And that language, sadly, is called Groovy. Uh, the situation that I have in mind specifically is imagine you have 100,000 functional tests in Spock, and then you try to do refactoring. In such a situation, it has been my experience that even IntelliJ does things wrongly, and you only discover that the tests are going wrong when you try to run them, and then you have to fix them, and then you fix some more, and then you fix some more. This could have been a more pleasant experience. If you're building services that are going to live for a long time, compiler, a type system, a checker, are tools, and they are very valuable tools. But enough about the language. Is it the framework? Which framework should we choose if we want to do modern Java microservices in the cloud today? Well, let's look at the agenda. We have a couple of options there. Or let's check the weather forecast, or let's check any framework forecast. Or maybe let's uh, see what other people at other conferences are saying. Some people go as far, as and that's actually a screenshot from Java Zones, uh, this year's Java Zones uh, schedule, they even went as far as say, saying the case against frameworks. Some people will say, let's use Spring. Some people will say, let's use Spring Boot. Some people will say, let's use the mono. There is a new monolith, micro, micro monolith, something like that framework uh, from around the Spring ecosystem as well. I haven't tried all of them. The bottom line is, Framework might, frameworks might add, add complexity, and that's potentially scary. Is the database going to be enough to call our services modern? Well, in 2010, in order to be modern, you have to use NoSQL, obviously. Then you have to use not only SQL, and now nobody cares, I think. Uh, if you use Cassandra, can you guarantee that your service is going to be successful, or your company is going to be successful? I cannot answer such a question. If you're using Mongo, can you guarantee that this is actually what makes your service or company successful? I don't think the problem lies there. Uh, if I'm going to do anything right now, I'm probably going to default to this guy because it's free. Uh, it is much cheaper than some other uh, solutions, not only Oracle, if I wanted to use the Enterprise Microsoft database, it's probably going to come at a cost at a certain level, but I just don't know, I, and I don't want to know, because this, in terms of features that it supports, it's extremely powerful, and it's very easy to run with, it's easy to run in a container, it's a good tool. And additional benefit of Postgres is it has a very well understood consistency and performance model, because it's a relational database. Most of you here probably have heard about the relational databases. I would even... Let's try this. Who here has never worked with a relational database? I see one hand in the room and a half. Because somebody will just being a bit shy. So uh, there is power in the execution model being well understood. Because if you understand what happens, if your service, if your startup becomes super successful, if you know where to optimize, if you know how to optimize because you have a mental model of this, it becomes easier. And that means that there are less moving parts that you have to worry about. If you need to understand consistency, if you want to say whether a certain piece of information that you've just written into the database actually made it and you can rely on it being there, it makes your lives easier. 
if that happens in a financial context, that becomes actually quite important. In terms of this being related to modern Java microservices in the cloud, again, database is not enough, not everything that needs to happen or not enough to make it or, or break it. Is it the architecture? Which architecture should we use? Should we use Lambda? Should we use uh, CQRS? Should we use event sourcing? Well, you can probably tell by now that there is no silver bullet. There is no one answer for all of this. And then let's get to the tests. Is it the tests? Actually, there is one thing that I discovered that everybody always wishes that they have written more tests. Some people, even in this conference, now say that you can generate some of that. I haven't tried this tool uh, for real, so I cannot say whether that's, that's a valid uh, statement. It's definitely something that we should try out. But the bottom line that happens between all of those statements that I said between uh, before is that adding new technology complexity to a new business problem is usually a recipe for something. I'll let you fill in what that something is. But if we're building software that's trying to solve a business problem and we don't fully understand the business problem and we as technologists like to solve problems, so we are also trying to add a technical problem so that we can at least solve something, it might be that we're trying to solve not exactly the most important problem in the world or in the room, but just so that we have some sort of completion and some source of dopamine. And this sometimes can go as far as people approaching a new problem in a domain that they are unfamiliar with. And before they know anything about what needs to happen, they will say, we're going to use Kotlin, we're going to use Kafka, and we're going to use Kubernetes. But do you know what you're going to be building? No. Uh, I, I completely agree with the laughter. That's a bit of a premature choice. Uh, this has gotten so popular that those three technologies used together sometimes have gotten the nickname of 3K Apocalypse. And before you take my words out of context, I have nothing against Kotlin, Kafka, and Kubernetes alone or used together. I have a problem with people saying that they are going to use those three technologies before knowing whether they fit their problem space. That's the problem that we're dealing with here. So what makes a service modern? Or maybe a different question we should be asking. Is there anything wrong with legacy? So what is a legacy system like? What's working, like? What's working with legacy like? It's slow, it's painful, it's tedious, it's, it's hard to make any changes. We prob you probably know what I'm talking about. As in some of the faces, some of the people nodding here, the pain on your faces, yes, I see you have worked with legacy. So let's look at another branch, one that's called biology and the d definition from Wikipedia of a process called calcification. That's a process in which calcium or calcium salts accumulate in body tissue. It means or it makes the body tissue less and less flexible. So if there is a enough calcification, something that's quite flexible, like for example, maybe skin, but I'm not an expert in biology, so I can make random comments here. It will not be flexible. It will, it, will, it will not want to move. I think that this process is actually quite applicable to software. I think software calcification is a thing. And I think that's uh, a very bad thing if it, if it happens. And it does happen. And this is actually more precise definition of... Uh, the problems that we get with uh, that happen with our systems. Now, before we explore this uh, uh, avenue a bit more, let's get back in time. And obviously, we need a proper vehicle to do that. So, a long, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, maybe there was a Big Bang, maybe there was not. I have no idea. I don't remember. Then, in the year 1997, according to Wikipedia, uh, EJBs happened. And according to Wikipedia, it's because of IBM. Some people have told me that it's not in exactly uh, as it happened, but for the duration of this talk, it's not necessary. And also, I'm only relying on the information that I have on Wikipedia. It's, I don't claim it's accurate. What happened after? Year 1999, we can do web applications in Java because we get uh, Java server specification. And awesome, year 2001, we get smart computers. We don't need to do anything anymore. Well, 
Not really, we get EJB 2.0. Does anybody here remember EJB 1 or 2? A few hands. Sorry to bring those memories back, guys. Uh, EJB 2.0, what was different between EJB 1 and 2? Well, EJB 2 could do local calls instead of uh, calling the same computer over an RMI, because why not? So they became faster, and they also allowed people to generate code using something uh, definitely very not, not awesome called xdoclet. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, keep it that way. Don't explore xdoclet, it, it was terrible. And it was so terrible that in year 2003, again, according to the sources of the internet, it might be inaccurate, but it presents a certain idea. A, a magic thing happened. The magic thing is called Spring. Spring in version 0 0.9, which happened as a reaction to EJBs, because EJBs were considered too complex. So we see that there is a certain direction in how software happens. And then year 2005, Ajax happens, so obviously everything needs enhancements. And obviously, Ajax stands for asynchronous JavaScript and JSON, because nobody really sends XML over Ajax anymore. And then in year 2006, we get this, EJB 3.0. EJB 3.0 was a very, very different beast to previous EJBs, because EJBs were considered too complex. You see a pattern already. Then comes year 2014. We get Spring Boot 1.0. Some people say that Spring Boot happened because Spring was considered too complex. Again, I'm not saying whether this is true. This is what opinions on the internet uh, tell. And then in year 2020, at one of the conference talks online, I found this awesome comment. I know, it's in Polish, so too long didn't read uh, loose translation is Java EE, so Java Enterprise Edition, had a small, well-thought API, 10 times smaller than the Spring framework. Is that accurate? Is that true? Well, if you know the history, you know that it's not really that simple. But if somebody approaches, enters the Java enterprise ecosystem in that year, then this is the impression that they had under a movie from a conference. Year 2016, microprofile. Some people say because Spring was considered too complex. And I think we've had enough. I think you can see something that happens here. When you're building software, what really matters to us as humans is feedback cycles. As in, we want to be able to reason about the software we're building. So we want to have a feedback cycle. Feedback cycle so that we know what we do and we know what the results of that action will be. In early, early days, those feedback cycles were extremely long and complicated because you had to package your software into a jar or ER or WAR or any other strange uh, uh, archive format. And that means that testing and actually reasoning about what is the impact of the code I'm doing to whatever happens in production is going to be very long. If it's too long, it becomes too complex for a human brain to comprehend, and we will not have it, which means we will just do something not knowing what will be the outcome. And that's bad, because we like to have feedback about what we're doing. We like to be told that we're doing a good job. We, will, we want to know whether something that we're doing is actually going to work. This is why we use unit tests. This is why we do integration tests. This is why we like microservices. This is why we like continuous delivery. This is why we want to deploy often, because we want to see what the outcome is much faster than later. So what makes a microservice or a service modern? I think that the overall answer and an overall trend in software is trying to achieve simplicity. So simplicity, easy, easy to say. Now, the question is, what do I mean by simplicity? And I'm going to present on what my personal experience with simplicity is going to be, or was, up, up until well today. And this might apply to you, this might not. Feel free to use whatever is uh, useful. But starting with the stack, how do you make a hello, web, uh, a hello world in Java? Well, if I took three random frameworks, uh, one is called Spark, not the Apache Spark that does data analytics, but it's, it's something called Spark Java or Helidon, or I look at Javelin. Uh, you can see that we can do a one-liner Hello World in Java. As in, it used to be uh, said that a typical one-liner in Java is 23 lines, if you remember those times. That was the situation because you had to have web XMLs and other strange deployment descriptors. Now it's much easier. So we can have an endpoint. We can make something listen on that endpoint, 
very, very quickly. And uh, I chose those frameworks just as an example. I said it is possible and it's quite, it's not only one that's radically shorter than the other, all of them allow the same. If, if you look at their activity, one has been around since, what is it, 2018, one has been around since 2012, and one has been around since 2017. So it's not a new idea. This is not this year's song. This is not last year's song. This is something that has been around for 10 years. And as of today, as in, I like Helidon just because I, I used it and it worked for me. It doesn't mean that none of the other or any of the other is better or worse. And there are talks in this very conference as, as well today and tomorrow about some other options, like for example, Micronode. I haven't tried it. Now, how does it relate to us having the service being modern? And how do, does it relate to us keeping the service modern? The thing that we want to do, if we're going to work with multiple services or maybe one complex monolith, it, one thing that we really, really, really want to do is prevent calcification. Because that will preserve that feeling that we can actually make changes in the software and we will be able to reason about what happens at the very end. Is there a gopher that we want to smack on the head or not? Uh, and that will keep us as uh, engineers, maybe maintainers, maybe operators of those systems happier. So, how does complexity happen? Usually one commit at a time. As in, have you ever met anybody with, that approached software with the attitude of let's build legacy? It's two, uh, two zero, year, year, year is 2022, two. let's build the most legacy system that we can right now. I haven't. I've met some people who at the conference participate in a contest of let's build the most enterprise legacy during I think one or two days of the conference and people tried and it turned out extremely difficult. As in we all know what the terrible aspects of, being, of software being legacy are, but if you try to build it from scratch, it's hard. It's actually very hard to make all of the bad mistakes and all of the bad decisions at once because why? Nobody wants to do it. So instead of what happens, usually in the companies that at least I've seen uh, working, is instead of approaching new software with let's build legacy, people say let's do the whatever or I don't care or nah. This means that they do not have a feedback loop between what happens, between the job that they do, and the results that are going to come out. Or the maintenance costs that they have to pay after they write the software in a specific way. And it might be because the company is set up like this. Maybe there is a team that does new feature development and maybe there is a maintenance team. Maybe it actually gets shipped to another content and doesn't different things happen. But if we work with microservices, usually there are there is a limited number of people that actually work with uh, a service and the code base is going to be owned by fewer people and those people will own the overall developer experience of that service, which means the feedback loop can be maintained. On the subject of frameworks, should you use frameworks, should you not use frameworks, I'll also drop in another story about decisions. 15 years ago, there was a significant number of people that approached any problem in Java with, I'm going to use Spring and Hibernate before knowing what to do, before knowing what the problem space, their, problem, their project is going to operate. And I said, you already know that this is not exactly great, but this happened. Now we have uh, the 3K apocalypse. Now you can ask, okay, but how does it help me? I said, I need to solve a project. Which framework should I choose? Which what mental model should I, should I apply when, I, when I'm choosing libraries that I want to maybe add to my project or not? And I would say, again, this is the thing that helps uh, quite a lot. Is the framework, is the library going to help or is it going to get in the way? Is there something that is going to surprise you when you have to, think, uh, when you have to fix issues? Or is it actually straightforward, but it's uh, somebody else wrote the code and I don't have to maintain it? Uh, I like the explicit, I like the non-intrusive, I like the things that I can easily replace if I have to, or I can at least step into the debugger, because when something goes wrong, or when I think the framework is broken, I can actually prove it to myself that it is, or it's me being stupid. And this goes 
into that separation, that there are two kinds of engineers, those that have and those that haven't fixed issues late at night. There is a certain correlation that I found with among people I speak to. If you have fixed a lot of issues in production, have been under a lot of stress, you usually tend to prefer simpler, more explicit tools. And it, it's just that, and it's very surprising. So, quality. Obviously, you should write tests. That's what everybody knows. The good question is how much, which kind, and what's the attitude that you should have in your testing. And this is answered in, when you look at your services or your products, and when you know what is the time frame that you're building your software for. Because if you know that you're building a software that's going to be just presented maybe at this conference, and is then going to be thrown away completely, together with the laptop, just to be sure, then writing tests to that piece of software probably will not give you a lot of benefit. On the other hand, if you're building software in an institution that expects to be alive in the next 10, 15, 50 years, then having tests is going to give back a lot. And this has been noticed and expressed in this very nice graph, shamelessly copy-pasted from Mar Martin Fowler's blog, uh, which tries to depict the quality versus longevity uh, relationship. Or how much total functionality is there in the software and how much time has passed. So how easy is it to add? And if your quality is higher, then over time it becomes easier and easier, especially compared to the low quality uh, solution, to add new features and to be uh, quite uh, certain that they work as expected. Now, the problem that we get when we are trying to start new projects, when you're trying to start new microservices, because everything is greenfield and we don't really have this complex uh, context and, and reference framework in our heads, is that we might make decisions here. If we make decisions here about productivity, about what will happen later, uh, that might lead us to wrong conclusions because we don't have the references. Now, if we know that the system that we're building for is going to live for a very, very, very long time, then we already know that it is going to be very useful and beneficial for us in the long run to have tests because high quality will make it in the grand scheme of things, much easier and much, much faster to iterate along the product. And to make matters worse, the crossing point, there is no way to say what it is exactly. To make matters even worse, in the duration of a company, a project might switch modes, as in something that might be a short-term fix might become a thing that stays around for a long time. You've probably seen quick fixes that went into production and stay there forever. But also, it might be that there is a startup that's trying to be very aggressive and explosive and has no idea whether what they are building is going to happen and is going to succeed. And then planets realign and all goes well. And now they are in the, they want to be in the blue, but they, are, they, they started building the software like in the brown area. This has happened. This has happened to many companies out there. There are talks about it, there are books about it, and this is also a valid situation, but if you know that you're already in the long-term uh, goal, long-term game, then build like you are uh, building for it. So, that means it is quite inefficient to build software that immediately needs a rewrite, which means it, if you write tests, you can prevent that because you will be able to iron out the ideas and the implementation of those ideas better, which means that also gives you a, a framework. A framework through which you can think whether what you write and what you enter and what comes out is it as expected. Now also, because we're software engineers in here mostly, we interact with code through our eyes and hands usually, which means having visual, having things that we can see explicitly or maybe have uh, have them read to us but that's a minority in terms of software uh, engineering population we like that and the opposition of things that are very visual and explicit are what i call magic frameworks what is a magic framework it's a framework that hides what's 
happening. So what I say is that code running should be visible. Ideally, all it also should, should be tested, but at least it should be visible. You should be able to step into that with a debugger. And it's not a new idea, it's not a unique idea. There have been many implementation of frameworks that looked at existing state of the state of the art and tried to simplify and deliver less and less magic. As in Drop Wizard was an attempt to simplify development. Pinnacle, the same. Java and Helidon Spark Java the same. This list is not complete. This list does not claim to be exhaustive, as in you will be able to find more and more examples like that. The underlying theme is unnecessary complexity is evil. Therefore, a page, so be gone. This is how you ask vampires to really leave you away. Uh, same you should do, and same I like doing, to unnecessary complexity. Now, how do you do it in code? Uh, one option is to have a service startup code that looks like this. If you have a method that's called main, then you can probably very easily say where the application starts because it's right over there. If you have a method called migrate, you know what it does. If you have migrations applied there, it's quite explicit. As in, somebody could say, yeah, but that's simple, and what value does it bring? The value that it brings is, if you have a, a new fresh starter in your project, and they are looking for the entry point for the application, you don't have to see and know about what framework of the day is making this entry point. Uh, it might be an annotated method, it might be something else, it might be a hook, it might be, I don't know, something else. It is very easy to know where to start the debugger. It is very easy to know if I have to add maybe another data source migration, where do I add it? As in this answer is obvious because I add it into the migrate method and I'm, he I'm happy. You can take it further. You can take it through constructor-based injection. Somebody could say, why? Because we have those uh, wonderful injection frameworks, and they do a very good job? Yes, but we, software engineers, interact with code using our eyes. If we see 45 dependencies injected into a constructor, you can see by it doesn't fit on my screen kind of measure that there is something wrong with the software, how it's, how it's designed, because it has too many dependencies. Whereas if you just do add inject, add inject, adding another dependency is very easy. Just add inject it, let the framework figure it out. What is the side effect? Your software might start up later and later and later. It might take a minute, and I know pieces of software which consider a minute a fast startup, or it might take 10 minutes to start up. I'm talking about all the beans being wired because there might be cir uh, circular dependencies between the beans. And those things happen. Those are not made up examples as in it happens in real world. Constructor-based injection is a friend because it makes it very explicit and visual when something needs to be injected. And if you, you're worried about refactoring, as in your ID will help you with that anyway. Another aspect that I found working very, very nicely with microservices and large fleets of microservices is immutability. Immutability expressed as case, data, value classes, records, as in whatever you want to call it. Things that you create and things that later cannot change their value. So you will see public fi final this, public final that. Uh, why public final? Because uh, this code was written before records were a thing and having getters is not really nice, as in I don't like get x, get y kind of pattern, as in it's going away. Uh, also here you can see wallet ID, wallet type, wallet owner ID, which means it's not all UUID, as in under the hood wallet ID and wallet owner ID are UUIDs, but in here they are not. And this means that the reader of the code, the engineer that has to evolve this method even further, will not, or hopefully will not, make a mistake of, hey, the wallet ID, should I compare it with wallet owner ID? Well, probably not, because they are different types. You can also use the type system to tell you exactly the same thing. Where, but if you keep it string, if you keep it UUID, it's not going to be able, because yeah, they look the same. And also between the lines, you might spot this guy. This guy, if you weren't paying attention, is present right over there. The check required, check required, check required, or check something. The idea is to uphold invariance absolutely everywhere. For example, this thing. This is going to just ensure that whatever is being injected is not null. You might have your own checkers that will ch check the validity of something, but if you assume a pattern in which you only create objects that are valid, which is a very sane and good thing that 
to do us, and it should not be possible to create an invalid object, then having those lines is going to ensure that in every single place you verify actively that something fulfills the requirements the, that you expect. So the invariants are upheld, which means if something explodes because th there is a null pointer, you have much less area to, uh, to scan, as opposed with, uh, well, we checked our entry points at the, at the I don't know, resource level, or, or, and then we're just passing objects, and then where does this null come from? I don't know. Somebody here could now ask, hey, but isn't doing all those checks redundant? Because you've checked it once, it should be okay. And uh, if to the person that's thinking exactly along those lines, I'm going to say, what an excellent audience you are. And the answer to this would be no. Because as the system grows, and our time frame is the company is going to be successful for 5, 10, maybe 15 years, this tiny stability pixie dust, almost, will compound to a great interest. Because it means that you don't have to worry about did it break here, did it break here, you will have any kind of failure. That will be rare, but it will happen eventually, much more localized. It will tell you where it happened and why it happened, and you will know what the invariant, what, which, which invariant was broken. And then, uh, also coming to a Java 17 or later, near you, we will be able to convert the left side of things to the right side of things. As an additional bonus, it's impossible to convert, well, it will be impossible to forget about equals and hash code because records generate it. And if you don't believe me, obviously you can do Java P and see what's, what's under the hood. But somebody here might, say, might think, hey, but there is this framework called Lombok. Can Lombok be used as a solution? And before we answer this question, or before we try to tackle the question of Lombok, let me ask you this. Can you see how this class could be used in a way that generates a bug. Somebody said uh, setter is restricted to package. Uh, that's not exactly the answer. Let me then give you the whole story. So this code, not in this shape, comes from an actual production bug. I, I think somebody's waving, raising their hand at the very end. So, uh, yes, you're, follow, you're exactly on the right track. The, the idea is that this might be considered immutable, but it's actually mutable because there is a setter. Uh, the story of the bug was exactly like that. That was, or as something similar, was used in a hash map as a key. And somebody thought, because it's add data, and there is so much conversation about add data, that this is probably mutable. They, somebody then added a setter. If you add a key to a hash map and then you mutate it, mutate it uh, something will not work. And that is going to be quite painful unless you want to iterate through all the objects that you keep in your hash map which is going to produce a bug. Now, people who know Lombok very well will tell me almost immediately that add data is mutable and uh, add value should have been used. And I will be com in complete agreement with them. But what we're looking at here is that, not that Lombok is the culprit. What is the real culprit in here is that you look at this code and what's happening behind the scenes is not evident. If you know Lombok very well, you will be able to say that. But there is quite a lot of us here in this room, and it's not obvious. It's not immediately in there. And it's, the font is big, the screen is big. Everybody gets to see it the same way. So when you have to debug it, you waste time. Or you think that, nah, the problem is probably not there because that looks like a data class. Or actually, it's not a data class because it's a data. And then you have to try to, de to debug into it. And in order to debug this, you have to have an ID set up with, Lomb with Lombok because otherwise you'll only get annotations. And we're not bashing Lombok here. It's not Lombok's fault. We have, or I have, a problem with surprises. Code should not surprise you. As in, if it looks like something, the surprise factor should be as little as possible because then 
the mental model that I have at the back of my head actually works and I can keep applying it and I can solve the problems that I really, really have. So what about mutable objects? Ideally, don't, if you can, or keep them in the data store or maybe use CQRS. Uh, keep them in Postgres because that works really, really well. But if you are using a relational database or any database whatsoever, uh, keep your migrations together with your code. As in, use Flyway or use LiquidBase. They are both awesome tools. And test your data stores, maybe with test containers, maybe with something else. Now, OK, but how do I query my database? And the answer to this is, I like Juke. And I think that Juke is probably the best way to query relational databases or the best approach to, to querying databases. If you don't know Juke, Juke is a DSL that allows you to uh, query relation, relational databases uh, like this. So you write a method called create and select from fetch. Can you figure out what SQL comes out of this? Yeah, probably. Uh, can you put this SQL into a toString and log it so that you can tell exactly what SQL comes out? Yes, it's very easy there. The usual question here would be why, for example, shouldn't I use JPA? Why shouldn't I use Hibernate? And I try to avoid using Hibernate and, and JPA for two reasons. One, how, uh, who here has con tried to configure Hibernate to log query texts and succeeded on the very first attempt? Three hands in the room. And it's a big room, uh, maybe four, sorry, four hands. Uh, now, it is possible, and Hibernate or JPA try to solve exactly that problem. They want to hide the SQL. But if you're working in an organization that is going to use a data store, and you know which data store you're using, and you, for example, want to understand what's happening within uh, that query, then being able to run and explain analyze over the data source is generally much easier. Second aspect is optimizing Hibernate qu query performance. There are caches. If you know them, you know them. If you don't know them, you're in for some surprises. If you've seen code that does uh, superfluous saves, refreshes, updates, reloads, and so on and so on, it is a sign of the framework behaving differently than what people expected uh, or how people expect it to behave. Whereas if you run SQL in a transaction, it's not exciting. It may be boring. It might be called a dated approach because people have been writing SQL in the 80s. Some have stopped writing software ever since. But it works, and it's very easy to reason about. And uh, that approach actually scales, because if you need to add something to that, it's easy. So legacy will happen to your software. Calcification, to an extent, sometimes will happen, and there is no good way to completely prevent it unless you keep rewriting. And uh, obviously, uh, there is this uh, truism that software is read more often than written. I tend to agree with that. Uh, what we can do about it? So we should talk about documentation. We should talk about documentation and we, we should look at how we can enforce the feedback loops within the teams. Ideally, within the team that's doing microservices, if you run the service, you understand how it operates. Or if you're the operator of the service, you know how it, what's the performance profile, for example. How, what, what errors will it usually generate? What's the load at a specific different hour of the day? Ideally, if you are also the person developing this, then you might call it, you build it, you run it. Because then, if you deploy something to production, you can see what impact of your changes is going to be in front. And then, if you introduce, for example, a performance regression, you can take it back, but you know that, hey, I didn't think about that. How did it happen? And you can see it firsthand. On the other hand, if there is a separate team that does it for you, well, you lose that. If, there, if you can uh, modify the infrastructure, if you also have to modify the infrastructure, and you can, and then you can observe what the result of that is, that's going to aim uh, and help you with the, with the feedback loop I mentioned. Now, let's look at architecture. But architecture not understood like uh, this, even though this is a very pretty picture from Twitter. But architecture as shared understanding. So shared understanding of architecture is usually 
not this. Because an inventory list is uh, just a list of what services do we have where. And also not this, because a service map is going to say what domains have which services, which is going to help us answer the question of which domain should own a specific service. Uh, but uh, think about architecture as a shared understanding so that people involved with the software have an understanding of the consequences of doing certain decisions to a piece of software. And if you have a team and you have a service and you already know the context is a service that is going to live for a long time, the question is how to document. Uh, one practice that I found tremendously useful is called architecture decision record or architecture decision locus and whatever you want to call it. Uh, the idea is very well uh, described at this GitHub repository link. So if you want the slides, uh, sure, have it. In short, the idea is that if there is a change, a significant change, a major change to be done to the service, it should be documented, capturing the context, capturing the things that uh, we are worried about and capturing the things that we are not worried about so that we can try to think about what are the expected consequences, what safeguards that we take about, I don't know, securing the service even more, and then we put it into a well accessible place. It might be Confluence, it might be something else, it might be a GitHub repository, it doesn't matter. What matters is who should make those documents, any engineer involved with uh, the service. Why? Because those are the people who have uh, well skin in, in the game. So they have the feedback loop because they will have to live with the consequences of those architectural changes. So what I am proposing is if you're dealing with microservices, ideally the teams should own them to the point in which there is, a, if, to a point in which if there are design changes to be made, then the team members should be the ones desi designing them. And that leads to a very simple question. Which tools should we use to document and diagram? I will just propose a few things that I found working for me. One is called PlatUML, which is open source and text-based diagram generator. And another one is called the C4 model. C4 model as in how and what structure should your documents have. Somebody already figured out a way that actually works, so let's not reinvent the wheel. But I said plant UML. Plant UML some, something that is text-based. Why? Because this means that you can store this in GitHub, and the thing on the right gets generated, which means whenever you run a build, you can have it automatically generated, which means if you need to make a change to this, it doesn't look scary. As opposed to, for example, having to go through a vendor cycle and get an enterprise architect license, which sounds very, very scary and probably lengthy and expensive and is going to be questioned. We want this to be relevant. If we want this to be relevant, changing this should be cheap, just like changing software should be cheap. And I said microservices, I said in the cloud. How do microservices interact? Well, usually it's something like this. As in, yes, I'm oversimplifying greatly. But my theory is that your microservices, or at least the microservices I have been working with, usually follow uh, one of those patterns. There is an RPC, there is something event based, or there are batches. And if I know the interaction patterns, I can actually capture them in some sort of an infrastructure common code, and I can solve it once and be done with it. And apply it to, to the whole company or apply it to a large uh, fraction, of, uh, fraction of the company because that doesn't really make such a huge difference. And okay, but what about monitoring? What about Kubernetes, cloud native, continuous delivery, the cloud? Hey, did I? lie to you in the subject? No, absolutely not. But there is a paper uh, from the year 2003 called IT Doesn't Matter. It talks about IT services becoming commodity. Just like servers were big and expensive and very exciting, then they, become, then they became cattle, not pets. Uh, now it's pods in, in Kubernetes, well, nobody really knows where they, where they exist. Uh, they don't matter. It probably will not matter to your company whether you use Kubernetes or VMs or I don't know what. Because it's probably, for most companies, not really that important. What matters is that changes get out there and the software is of good quality because the business problems and business contexts actually matter a bit more. So, I would say 
that monitoring, you should absolutely solve it in your company. If you're not a monitoring company, you should probably use one of the existing solutions that does it well and just apply the same pattern across all of the services that you have out there. Deployment, create a pattern, apply it, so that your teams don't have to spend their creative and inventive time on solving problems that others have solved. Just use something that works and, and, and be done with it. Continuous delivery, same story. Because software should solve business problems. Which leads us to the very last phase of this talk, which is how to capture business reality. Uh, I'm only going to point at the technique called event storming. I will not even have enough time to introduce it in any way. Uh, but if you've worked with event storming, awesome. Kudos to you and congratulations to you. If you haven't, if you need to find a way to how, to you, how do you convert what the business wants but cannot really express and how do I connect that with software, try to explore this. Look for people who have used this because this is a very, very good and useful technique. And now, because we're running out of time, I'm going to quickly recommend some books. Yeah. And as usual, slides take more pictures than me. What can I do? I'm not going to be a celebrity. Uh, TLDR of what you've just heard. There is a lot of complexity when you're dealing with microservices and solving new business problems. So. If you are optimizing for the long term, optimize for the long term, build quality in, build resilience in, and software that is simple to change, simple to understand, and simple to scale is usually going to be much easier, much nicer to work with, which means uh, you will be able to have a feedback loop and be able to reason about it much easier. And now I think we should get into the Q&A. So. Um, Slido doesn't seem to be working for me, but I have backup questions built into the talk because things might always break. So would I say that dependency injection is wrong or using a dependency injection framework is wrong? Uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, the thing that I like is having visual signal about how many dependencies a piece of code has. Having container ba uh, sorry, uh, constructor-based injection makes it very explicit. If you have to if you have a repository uh, injected into a renderer, you can see that something is off. If you just put a field, there is no, that, no not that much signal there. And we get into the Lombok situation. Do I like Lombok? Do I uh, say that we shouldn't? You shouldn't use it. Uh, I don't have an answer that will fit everybody, but. Uh, I will say that Lombok is a very interesting library that has an installation procedure that you need an, an IDE uh, to be effective with. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's wrong by, on its own. I know people who have used Lombok in a very restricted way, and they are using it exactly in the right uh, way. On the other hand, if somebody's using all the wealth and breadth of whatever Lombok offers, that is probably going to be a bit too complex. And unless I manage to get onto Slido, or somebody else has gotten onto Slido, then we're going to go to here. Which means, thank you so much for being at my talk. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, I'll be around. May the force be with you.